I need to get something off my chest, because I can't deny what happened to me last summer out on the ranch. It defies any rational explanation, and I'm still trying to make sense of the whole thing. It was the middle of June, and I was working the night security shift at a massive cattle ranch in the isolated hills of northern Wyoming, not far from the Bighorn Mountains. Part of my duties involved doing regular patrols around the outer boundaries of the 30,000-acre property to watch for trespassers or potential cattle rustlers. On this particular night, I was making my rounds on the far eastern side of the ranch, around 2 a.m. The summer moon was full and bright, making the rugged landscape almost as visible as daylight. As I drove down the dirt road hugging the barbed wire fence line, something emerged from the tree line up ahead that made me slow my vehicle. At first, I thought maybe it was a moose or a bear, but as I got closer, I realized this was no ordinary animal. Standing squarely in the middle of the road was an enormous hair-covered thing. It had to be at least eight feet tall, if not taller, with a barrel-chested body and incredibly broad shoulders. Its arms were easily four feet long, hanging down past its knees with massive, powerful hands at least the size of a catcher's mitt. But the most chilling feature was its head. It had a protruding ape-like muzzle and sunken eyes that seemed to faintly glow from the moonlight. The face was flat, with flared nostrils and what looked like a permanent sneer across its lips, revealing gruesome fangs. Coarse matted fur covered its entire body in a sickening grayish-brown color. When I first laid eyes on this ungodly creature, I instinctively slammed on the brakes of my truck, skidding to a stop about 50 yards away from it. We locked eyes for what felt like an eternity, the exterior lights of the truck illuminating its horrific features. That's when the real terror set in, a deep, visceral dread unlike anything I've experienced before or since. Suddenly, the creature reared up to its full height, pounding its gigantic fists against its barrel chest. The resulting roar shook me to my core. It was so deafening and powerful that the truck's exterior mirrors were actually vibrating. The sound seemed to reverberate across the landscape and last for minutes, a deep guttural bellowing that sounded almost ancient. I've heard my fair share of loud noises, gunshots, thunderstorms, you name it, but this, this sound was on another level entirely. In that moment, I was certain it could have been heard for miles. Without consciously deciding to, I threw the truck into reverse and stomped on the gas pedal as hard as I could. The rear wheels dug into the loose dirt as I tore out of there, fish tailing wildly and kicking up a thick cloud of dust behind me. I drove like a bat out of hell along that lonely road, glancing fearfully in the rearview mirror, expecting to see that colossal, hair-covered monstrosity charging after me at any moment. But it never gave chase. In fact, the last view I had of the creature was it casually turning its broad back to me and lumbering off into the tree line from where it first emerged, as if our encounter didn't phase it in the slightest. I've never driven so recklessly in my life, but I was running on pure terror at that point. I made it back to the main ranch house in record time, sweating and shaking uncontrollably but trying to keep it together. I tried to relay to the owner what I had witnessed, but he just looked at me in a way that said he didn't think I was cut out for my job if I was spooked by a big old bear. Let me tell you, that sure as hell wasn't any bear I've ever seen. Bears don't stand eight feet tall and weigh what must have been at least 800 pounds of muscle and matted hair, and they definitely don't let out earth-shaking roars that rattle your bones. What I encountered that night was something else. Something not of this world, at least not anymore. Maybe it was some long forgotten throwback from the past that managed to survive. Whatever it was, one thing's for certain, it was very real, and it made me feel more insignificantly human than I'd care to admit. Over the following days and weeks, I tried to rationalize what I saw through some admittedly far-fetched theories but nothing could explain the sheer enormity and grotesqueness of the creature. There's local lore of a similar, hairy, wild man creature spotted through the years in the Bighorn Mountains, but those stories hardly captured the sheer raw power and otherworldliness of what I came face to face with. 
Some folks might try to write it off as a creative tale or an encounter with the mythical Bigfoot, but I know what I saw out there in the cold light of the full moon. It was something ancient and primal, something not meant for this modern world we've tamed. Mark my words, that thing was no myth, cryptid, or legendary folktale. It was very real and very terrifying. I only worked that ranch for another week after my encounter before quitting on the spot. There was no way I could go back out on those night patrols, constantly wondering if I might cross paths with that unholy titan of a creature again. I'm usually not one to scare easy, but that experience shook me to my core in a way I still can't fully articulate. So, there you have it. The honest-to-God truth about the most bizarre, inexplicable encounter of my life. Maybe someday I'll uncover a rational explanation that can settle my mind, but deep down, I know there are certain things in this world that simply defy logic and reason as we know it. All I can say is that you need to be cautious of what roams those isolated hills and forests after dark, because there are monsters out there that are more real and terrifying than you might think. My name is Greg, and I'm 27 years old. Pretty much my whole life has been spent right here in Charlestown, going to school, working construction jobs, spending night with friends. It's a historic city with a lot of old buildings in some towns on the outskirts that have been around for centuries. You can't go more than a couple blocks downtown without seeing a plaque about some haunted place or other. I've lived here so long that I pretty much tuned all that ghost talk out a long time ago. Just stone houses with some quirky stories attached. At least that's what I always thought. At least until that night in October when I came face to face with something that changed my mind completely. It happened on a Saturday night in late October. I was out driving alone after midnight, heading home from a friend's house over on the west side. I took my usual route cutting through the back streets instead of taking the main roads. Fewer stoplights to deal with that way. As I was driving down Chaplin Street, which is just a short residential street, I noticed up ahead on the right side of the road what looked like a person stumbling around near some shrubs and trees. I slowed down to get a better look, and that's when I realized this wasn't any person at all. It was something else entirely. This thing was about five feet tall, with a really skinny build. Its arms seemed too long for its body. It had a small head too, and I couldn't make out any distinct facial features from the distance, just some dark hollow areas where the eyes and mouth should be. The weirdest part was its legs. They bent backwards like an animal's back legs. Its movements were all jerky and unnatural, almost spastic in a way. It would freeze in place for a few seconds, then abruptly whip its body in a different direction. It was skinny as a rail with these really long, lanky arms that seemed too big for its frame. The arms didn't swing normally either. The joints bent in weird angles as it shuffled about. The head was weirdly tiny too, and I couldn't make out any distinct facial features at first, just dark hollows where the eyes and mouth should be. But the legs, that's what really made my stomach churn. They were bent backwards at the knee like a deer's or dog's back legs. Every few steps, it would have to pause and readjust its balance. Just a totally unnatural. At first, I thought maybe I wasn't seeing clearly, so I blinked hard a few times and shook my head. But it was still there, shuffling around in that bizarre, erratic way. I felt unsettled just looking at it. For a second, I thought maybe it was a person who had lost something in the bushes. But I quickly realized that was not possible by the way it looked and moved. My heart started pounding as my mind tried to categorize it. An animal, maybe? But what kind of creature walks on two legs and has arms like that? I must have stared at it for a good 20 seconds before the thing seemed to sense my presence. It froze for a split second, then whipped its head around to look right at me. Even though I couldn't see its eyes, I could feel its gaze lock onto me. That's when the fear really kicked in. This wasn't any stray dog or other animal. This was something unnatural and totally wrong. Before I could even think about driving away, the thing started coming straight for me at one hell of a speed. It covered those 30 yards from the trees to my car in just a couple seconds, bounding in these huge freaky leaps. 
I hit the gas and tore off down Chaplin Street as fast as I could. My heart was pounding out of my chest and my hands were shaking on the steering wheel. Even though I knew those roads, I couldn't even think of how to get out of there. I could hardly believe what I'd just seen, but there was no mistaking it. I kept glancing in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see it chasing after me on those freakishly bent legs. But there was nothing there. I made a couple of hard turns, cutting through some side streets just to be sure I wasn't being followed. Finally, after maybe 10 minutes of just aimless driving, I started to calm down a bit. I'd heard stories before of people claiming to see supernatural creatures, but I always dismissed that kind of thing as nonsense. Now, I wasn't so sure. I considered stopping by the police station to report it, but then I thought, what am I going to tell them? That I saw some weird, half-human monster along the side of the road? No, I needed to just get home and get some sleep, try to convince myself that I could return to normal and get past this experience. When I finally got back to my place, I was too wired to sleep right away. I made myself a strong drink and just sat there on the couch, replaying it all in my head. The jerky movements, the strange shape, the way it bounded right at me. My body started involuntarily shaking, just thinking about what could have happened if I hadn't seen it in time to get away. The thought of what could have happened is terrifying and won't leave my mind. Why was I the unlucky one to catch a glimpse of something that shouldn't exist? Eventually, I must have fallen into some kind of restless sleep, but you can bet I had the hallway light on, just in case and my baseball bat was right there beside me. In the end, there was no further word of the thing. No mention in the paper or on the news of any other sighting. So, somehow, it's just me down here, dealing with the horror of knowing what exists in South Carolina. My name is Dave, and I've worked as a ranger at Voyagers National Park in northern Minnesota for about five years now. It's a beautiful place with lakes, forests, and rocky outcroppings. Most days are pretty routine, but something really strange happened to me last summer that I can't quite explain. It was early July, so the summer crowds were in full swing. I was doing my normal patrol, hiking along the shoreline trail. The day was hot and muggy, sun beating down. As I rounded a bend, I noticed some large animal droppings on the trail up ahead. My first thought was bear, but as I got closer, I could see they looked wrong somehow. Too large for a bear, and they were an odd cylindrical shape. I bent down to get a closer look. That's when I heard a loud crash and splintering of wood, like a tree falling, off to my right towards the lake. I grabbed my radio to call it in as a possible dangerous situation. Before I could get a word out, I heard heavy footsteps, too heavy and solid sounding to be a bear. Then it emerged from the brush maybe 50 yards away. I'll never forget the sight. It was massive, at least eight feet tall, with a barrel-chested body covered in shaggy, matted dark fur. Its arms were powerfully muscled and hung low, almost past its knees. The head was small compared to the body, but had a sloped, elongated face with a muzzle. It turned towards me, locking eyes with me. My heart was pounding out of my chest as the thing started moving towards me taking heavy, thunderous strides. I fumbled for my pistol, the radio dropping to the ground. As I raised the gun and shouted for it to stop, the thing opened its mouth and let out a roar that I could feel vibrating in my bones. I've never heard a sound like that in my life. So deep and powerful. That's when I got a glimpse of the teeth, rows of fangs like jagged knives. I fired a couple shots in the air, hoping to scare it off, but it didn't even flinch. It just kept coming, closing to within 30 yards of me now. That's when it reared up onto its hind legs, towering even taller. It must have been 10 or 11 feet high at that point. Its head was brushing the lower branches of the trees. The roar it let out this time was deafening. I could feel the sound waves pounding my body. With my ears ringing, I fired off a few more shots into the air. But the gunshots didn't seem to phase it at all. If anything, they only enraged it further. It dropped back down to all fours and charged right at me with shocking speed for something so big. I turned and ran as fast as I could back down the trail. Adrenaline was the only thing keeping me ahead of that monster. 
crashing through the brush and trees behind me. Every few seconds I risked a glance back, seeing that terrifying snarling muzzle and those dagger-like teeth drawing ever closer. Up ahead was a rocky outcropping overlooking one of the lakes. With no other options, I scrambled up the rocks, finally putting some distance between me and the creature. It snarled and roared furiously from below, swiping at the rock face but unable to climb up. I stayed up there for what felt like hours, not taking my eyes off the monster pacing and growling below, waiting for any opportunity to get at me. A couple times it reared up, easily tall enough to grab me off the rocks, but I just scrambled back further, out of its reach each time. Finally, after the sky grew dark, the thing stopped its agitated pacing and let out a last bone-chilling roar before turning and crashing back off into the forest the way it came. I didn't move from that rock until first light, when I could finally see other rangers approaching from the trail in the distance. I tried explaining what happened, what I saw, but they just looked at me like I was crazy, which I can't really blame them for. I know how unbelievable it all sounds, but I also know what I saw out there. Once I was off that rock outcropping, I led the rangers to the area where the thing first appeared. We found more of those huge cylindrical droppings. There were also deep gouges torn into the earth and trees shredded and snapped like matchsticks from when it barreled through. Even with all that physical evidence, they still looked at me skeptically when I described the massive, shaggy, ape-like beast. A few of the younger guys barely suppressed laughs and comments like, You been out in the sun too long, Dave? The head ranger was at least more professional about it. He listened carefully and didn't dismiss my story entirely. But he said something to the effect of, Could have been a bear or woods ape. Adrenaline can mess with your perception. I could tell he didn't entirely believe me either. What really sealed it for them was when we found one of my spent cartridges out on the trail. The ranger held it up to me with furrowed brows and said, You really think firing on a bear was the right call here? I didn't have a good reply. From their perspective, it must have looked like I lost my cool out there. In their final report, they described the whole thing as an unidentified bear encounter where no animals were harmed. They made it clear I wouldn't be officially reprimanded, but that any more reckless behavior could lead to serious consequences. So officially, that's the story in the park records. But I know what I saw out there. It was no bear or woods ape. This was something else. Something that still gives me nights of restless sleep, wondering what might happen next. I'll never forget the night I came face to face with that thing in the woods behind my house. Even now, just thinking about it makes me feel unsettled deep down. It was a Friday evening in early October. The weather had been nice that day, so after dinner I decided to take a short hike on the trail that starts behind my backyard. I live in Boulder, Colorado, and am an avid hiker and that little trail was one of my favorite places to unwind after a long week at work. I headed out around 7 p.m., figuring I'd be back before it got fully dark. The first half mile or so was pretty routine. Just your basic wooded path surrounded by trees and bushes, the usual sights and sounds of critters scampering about. But then, I started getting this nagging feeling that something wasn't quite right. At first, I couldn't put my finger on it. The forest seemed quieter than normal, which struck me as odd. Normally, that trail is alive with all kinds of noises. Birds chirping, squirrels chattering, leaves crunching underfoot. But it had gone almost dead silent. That's when the hair on the back of my neck started to rise. I stopped for a moment to get my bearings and listen closely. That's when I first heard the snap of a twig or branch breaking off in the distance behind me. I turned to look over my shoulder but didn't see anything out of the ordinary, just trees and brush as far as I could see. Shrugging it off as probably just a deer moving through the woods, I kept hiking, but I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling that I was being watched or followed. Every few minutes I'd stop again to listen, and each time it sounded like whatever was back there was a bit closer. After about 15 more minutes, I rounded a bend and the trees opened up into a small clearing, and that's when I saw it. This massive hairy beast standing upright like a man. 
It had to be at least seven feet tall, maybe even bigger. Its body was covered from head to toe in thick, matted brown fur. At first, I thought it must be a bear, despite its very unbear-like posture and gait. But as it got closer, emerging more into the fading evening light, I could make out other distinctly unbear-like features. The elongated muzzle and pointed ears, the thick razored claws on its hands and feet, the glint of these sharp, wicked-looking teeth protruding over its blackened lips, which were curled back in a vicious snarl as it fixed me with these glowing, feral eyes. That's when the reality hit me like a punch to the gut. This wasn't any bear. I was just yards away from whatever the hell kind of monster that thing was. My heart felt like it was going to explode out of my chest as it closed in, each bone-chilling step shaking the ground beneath my feet. I wanted to run, but I was frozen in sheer terror. The creature seemed totally focused on me, like I was its prey. It pulled its lips back even further, letting out this guttural, rattling growl that made my blood run cold. I've truly never heard any sound like it before or since. Fetid spittle and drool flew from its powerful jaws as the growling intensified. It leaned forward, still stalking toward me in this unnatural, hunched-over posture apparently ready to pounce on me as soon as it could. I don't know what finally kicked me out of my trance of fear, but something made me snap to my senses. With every ounce of strength I could muster, I turned and ran. Ran like my life depended on it, because it absolutely did. I tore through the woods as fast as my legs could carry me, branches whipping across my face, not even caring which way the trail went. All that mattered was putting as much distance between me and that thing as humanly possible. I could hear the sounds of it crashing through the underbrush behind me, snarling and gnashing its teeth. It was giving chase. My heart pounded so hard I could barely breathe. Panic and adrenaline coursed through my veins. In desperation, I scanned the darkening forest for any place to take shelter or hide. That's when I spotted a large, hollowed-out log up ahead and dove inside without a second thought. I laid there in the confined space, gasping for air and praying that nightmare couldn't pick up my scent or hear my ragged breathing over its own earth-shaking footsteps. The sounds of its pursuit seemed to circle back and forth frantically, always agonizingly close by. At one point, it let out this bone-chilling, elongated roar of fury that made my entire body convulse in terror. I don't know how long I stayed crouched in that log. 20 minutes, an hour, it felt like an eternity. Eventually, the noises started to recede into the distance as the creature moved off, hopefully having given up its hunt. When I finally felt it was safe to emerge, I was already hopelessly turned around and lost in the dark woods. It took me what felt like hours more to find my way back out to civilization, frantically checking over my shoulder the entire way. When I finally made it back home, I was trembling uncontrollably, drenched in sweat and coated in dirt, scratches, and bruises. I must have looked like I'd barely survived a bear attack or something. My family was frantic with worry and kept peppering me with questions about what happened, but I just couldn't find the words to explain it. What could I possibly say? That I was attacked by some unholy, monstrous beast? No, definitely not. So I just told them I got turned around on the trail after dark and got spooked in the pitch black forest, that's all. But they could see the sheer terror still on my face, even as I said it. Deep down, I think part of me is still out there in those woods, never able to fully escape that encounter. I haven't set foot on that trail since, nor anywhere near those woods. I'm not sure I ever will again, because I know whatever I saw out there was no drunken hallucination or prank. It was horribly, utterly real. And the thought of catching even the faintest glimpse of it again is enough to make me completely petrified. So that's my story. Make of it what you will. All I know is something monstrous lurks in those woods. And it's the stuff of living nightmares unlike anything you can possibly imagine. Tom grew up near a train yard. A lot of sounds come from a train yard. All hours of the night, metal is grinding and turning and clanking together. Sometimes it's quiet, 
like the whisper of the air brakes or the chugging of a car just starting to roll out of place. Other times it's loud, sometimes it's like thunder. Tom spent so much of his youth near that train yard that he grew particularly accustomed to blocking it out. The grinding and clanking was all background noise to him. It wasn't any different than the low volume in the living room TV. There were few times, very few times, where a collision genuinely startled Tom in the middle of the night. It's easy to forget yourself in moments like that. It's easy to forget exactly where you are when the soundtrack of a nightmare starts blaring into reality. That was what Tom heard on this particular night. He woke, eyes wide, and sat upright in his bed so quickly that the room was still spinning when he looked around. Had it been a crash? It was loud, whatever it was. He'd been too deeply asleep to recognize it. The sound had faded by the time he was awake and alert, but the cold chill was still crawling across his skin. He was still shivering, cowering. If it had only been a crash, why was his body reacting like that? He swallowed the dry lump in his throat and threw off the covers. Then the sound came back. A low, long-winded howl rattled the windows and seeped into Tom's bones. It wasn't like a train car at all. It wasn't the sound he was used to hearing from outside. It came from the same direction, but this sound was more like the roar of a lion trapped in the zoo. It was deep and animalistic. It was the warning of a creature ready to do anything to escape. But escape what? That question was even more pungent than the icy shiver running down Tom's spine. He needed an answer. He needed to know what was lurking so close to his home. If he didn't track it down, how could he ever step foot outside? How could he feel safe tomorrow night, or the night after that, if this night ended in mystery? He grabbed a baseball bat and slid on his shoes. He'd hopped the fence into the train yard before, usually just to impress his friends during a night of drinking. So getting inside was as easy as throwing open his own back door. When he landed on the other side, he hunkered down real low. There were more sounds now. He could hear the voices of men, muffled and agitated. They were tossing commands back and forth, barking about positions and safety measures. It was their voices that made Tom feel endangered. It was strange because he thought he'd need to be scared of whatever made the howling sound from earlier in the night. He kept moving anyway. Now he wanted to know who the men were. He wanted to know what they were doing there. The train yard was usually reserved for soy and grain. Something else must have come in. Security was never this tight. He caught a glimpse of the men from his place in the shadows. They were soldier types, heavily outfitted, carrying guns. Tom's baseball bat felt like a toy in his hands, but it was all he had so he held it close, kept quiet, kept watching. One of the sliding side doors on a nearby train car was propped open. A ramp was hanging out of it. He could only vaguely see the interior. The lighting was bad, but it looked like there were deep grooves on the interior walls, places where the dark metal had been scratched, revealing a brighter silver color beneath. It didn't make any sense, unless something had exploded inside the car and damaged the inner walls. What else could have caused those grooves? That's when he saw them dragging something. Four of the men were hauling it back, hoisting it up the ramp. They were panning and grunting. It was massive, so it had to be heavy. Tom squinted. Each soldier was holding onto a limb. They were arranged like the arms and legs of a man, but the rest of the details didn't match. The body was covered in long fur. It looked thin and coarse. Claws sprouted from the fingertips and the joints in the legs didn't bend the way they should have. The creature's head was hanging face down, swinging with each step of its captors. Tom could see what looked like a long snout. It looked like a wolf's head. A cluster of three small metal cylinders jutted from the monster's back. They looked like darts of some kind, maybe used to knock the creature unconscious. When they reached the top of the ramp, the strange beast started to stir. The men started shouting again. They moved more quickly, tossing the creature into a part of the car that Tom couldn't quite see. They ran out in pairs, sliding the ramp back into place and locking the door shut. Then came another howl, muted this time by the thick metal walls. That was enough for Tom. He had his answers, some of them anyway, and he didn't like them one bit. He knew every second he lingered was another chance for those weird men to spot him. He ran. 
He ran and started telling this story to his friends, then to strangers. Of course, nobody believed him, but that only makes a person want to tell a story more, right? Tom doesn't live near the train yard anymore. Just the sound of grinding metal, or the late night blow of a train horn, is enough to remind him of that howl. It's enough to remind him of the sleeping creature that he never wants to see wake up. When was the last time you ran from a cat? They're cute mostly, stalking a toy from around the corner, kicking at the plush mouse with their back feet. They watch birds from the windows and chatter at the squirrels when they run by. Domestication has made cats adorable. A simple meow is often enough to get somebody's attention, and an excited awe. This encounter featured a different kind of cat. James wasn't the outdoorsy type. He didn't like hiking, camping, fishing. He did like wildlife, though. Sometimes he even liked it enough to go looking for it. Or so the story goes. How he ended up in the woods, I guess, doesn't matter. What matters is what he found out there. First came the feeling of being watched, followed. Every step he took deeper into the woods, the more hairs James could feel leaping to attention on the back of his neck. He swatted at the chills as they spread across his skin, convincing himself that he was just being paranoid. He was always uncomfortable in the woods, right? So of course he was psyching himself out. Then something snapped behind him, a branch, breaking under the weight of some animal. Too loud to be anything small, anything he could defend himself against. It sounded like a baseball bat breaking over someone's knee, as if that was possible. The deafening crack froze James in place. He reached for his bear spray, nearly dropping it as he unclipped the canister from his backpack. It had to be a bear, didn't it? Bears were the biggest things in the woods. But that wasn't what James saw ducking into the shadows. He saw a lithe but muscular back, covered in short dark fur, slinking between the bushes and the trees. That fur shined like a pond in the moonlight. It moved too smoothly, too gracefully, and too low to the ground to be any kind of bear. Couldn't be a dog either. Dogs weren't graceful, certainly not the wild ones. White fangs and a pink tongue suddenly became visible in the darkness. The creature's mouth yawned open, and a shriek-like hiss came from the back of its throat. It wasn't the right color for a mountain lion. James tripped over his own feet and fell to the ground. The monster's mouth snapped shut, and its eyes locked onto James' position, slit pupiled in a brilliant green. The creature's ears were long. When they folded against its head, they almost looked like curved horns. A tail flicked behind the beast. It was a cat of some kind, or at least feline adjacent. Too big though, bigger than two men. Big enough that one leap would put it on top of James, and one bite would put him out of his misery. There were stories about this thing. People called it different names. The Black Howler, the Nightshade. It had been dismissed as a misidentified species of wolf, James thought. So much for that. He'd seen wolves and they never looked quite this evil. It wanted to hurt him and James knew it. He didn't move. Cats like the chase, right? They like the thrill, the game. If he didn't look like the fun type of prey, maybe the monster would find a different sport to pass the time. It crawled closer, slow moving and close to the ground. The way its spine moved almost reminded James of a snake, fluid and patient, a lot more patient than James himself was feeling. Claws like paring knives inched out of the monster's paws and sunk into the soil. It was tense. The muscles beneath its skin were rippling, flexing. Was it going to jump? James decided not to find out. He yelled at the monster and raised the bear spray between them, firing a stream of the repellent straight for the cat's eyes. It burned James too. His eyes streamed tears and his nose and throat filled with mucus. He coughed and spat and climbed to his feet all while the creature yowled and retreated. It was hissing and spitting and swiping at the terrain. That was better than his own body, James thought. To keep it that way, he ran. He ran blind through the woods, hoping he was headed in the right direction. His eyes were nearly swollen shut, and it burned just to breath. The fresh air stabbed his irritated lungs with every breath. But if he stopped, he knew he was dead. He was sure the cat would recover before he did. If he could just make it to the bottom of the next hill, 
James tripped again, this time falling forward, and rolled the rest of the way down. The rocks and thorns and branches had hacked into him, scraped his flesh, and left him bleeding. It was better to be cut by the earth than by the monster. Besides, he was nearly home. He was nearly back to the safety of his four walls, his locked door, and the running water he could use to rinse his eyes. He ran all that way without ever knowing if he was really being chased. He didn't know he was safe until he heard the cats howl, loud and piercing, like the wails of an injured child. James closed the door on that sound. He wasn't going to be lured back out by the howling. He rinsed his eyes and laid prone beneath the stream of his showerhead for what felt like hours. He reminded himself of all the things he already knew. He hated the outdoors, camping, hiking, fishing. None of it had been for him. The animals weren't for him either, it seemed. He could go without ever seeing a deer again, if it meant staying safe from that monster. James steers clear of cats now, too. Domesticated or not, he can't look at them without remembering that thing. Watching a kitten chase a toy is a lot less endearing when you've been in that toy's position. Some encounters are about a slow and ominous sense of dread. They're about the buildup of suspense and the hanging moments before the creature or entity is spotted. There can even be life lessons in there. Be aware of your surroundings. Be prepared. Then there are the encounters where the only lesson is run. Don was on his third day of camping in False Cape. It's a park in Virginia. The forestry there thins and eventually turns to an open sandy beach. On the right day, you can get the best of all three. Sunshine, water, and woodlands. Don had hoped to experience that trifecta. When he woke up on that third day, though, he was under attack. The moment he opened his eyes, his world was shaking. The sides of Don's tent were flailing from side to side. The sunlight gave the orange polyester a warm glow. That light framed the monster outside. He could see its arms grappling with the tent. Its broad shoulders, wide enough to snap Don in two. A large, cone-shaped head like a gorilla. Don thought it was a nightmare. He tried to rub his eyes to blink away the terror that was encroaching at the edges of his vision. But it was real. The tent started to rip. The sound of the fabric being pulled apart snapped Don's full attention back to reality. He could feel it. See it. He could hear it growling now. Growling and gnashing teeth that he could only imagine were long and pointed. He could smell it. Damp and salty like a wet dog back from the ocean shore. The creature's thick fingers poked through the holes in the tent and yanked them into long gashes. Glimpses of fur and dark scarred musculature peeked at Don, who was trying to scramble backwards. The entrance to the tent, the zipper and the door flap were at his back. If he could get it open, he could run or try to. There was no other choice. He tugged at the zipper and half crawled, half fell into the daylight outside. The monster heard the movement, maybe even saw him escaping. It tried to lunge forward but got tangled in the tent. Now that it was in shreds, the material was acting more like a net than a solid structure. It wrapped around the creature's limbs, and the beast tumbled to the ground. Don was already running. He looked back only once, just long enough to see that the monster was fighting to pull itself free. It was still trying to move toward him, to give chase. It clawed at the ground as if the soil could give it some kind of leverage. It roared at his back. That was all Don needed to see and hear. If he slowed down, he was done for. Maybe he was done for anyway. Even with all the newfound distance between his feet and the campsite, he could still hear the remainder of the tent being turned into scrap. He knew the creature was free. The problem was, Don was running the wrong way. There was no freedom up ahead. The mouth of his tent had opened up toward the beach. When he hit the coast, he'd be stuck between the tide and the creature. Even as he ran, he knew he was doomed. For a brief moment, Don thought of turning. He thought of circling around and back, trying to get to a road or even to his car. But the trees were shaking behind him. The birds were soaring in a frightened panic, scattering in every direction. He'd been reduced to the same thing, prey, desperately trying to find a way out of a predator's jaws. Don could hear the growling again. 
the stench of the beast was getting stronger. He didn't need to look to know how close the creature really was. He was already thinking of its breath on his neck. When his feet sunk into sand, he kept running. It was harder. It slowed him down. But what else could he do? He tripped and tasted a mouthful of the coast. Didn't have time to spit. He clumsily climbed back to his feet and continued. Maybe it couldn't swim. Maybe he could get out just a few feet from the shore and the creature would turn back. Don splashed into the water. It rose to his ankles, then his knees. He was already so tired, so sore. The thought of swimming aimlessly was almost as heavy as the water itself. He did the unthinkable. He slowed down. He stopped when the water reached his waist. He couldn't hear the growling anymore. The smell was replaced by the actual ocean air. Don risked a glance back toward the tree line, expecting to see the monster halfway between the brush and the brine. He expected it to be barreling down upon him, but it wasn't there at all. Don exhaled, doubled over until his face was nearly in the water, trying to catch his breath. Each drop of sweat that fell into the ocean carried a bit of Don's fear with it. The adrenaline was fading, and for the second time that morning, reality was setting in. It was almost enough to make him smile. It was gone. It had given up. And when Don eventually went back to his campsite with a group of hikers, the creature was nowhere to be seen. There were many signs of the attack. The tent had been eviscerated. Large footprints had sunk and skewed into the dirt. But there was nothing to distinguish it from any other unlucky encounter in the woods. No definitive proof. Don was just glad to have learned his lesson. It wasn't about the mysteries or the wonders or the secrets of the woods. That day, for Don, it was just about survival. And when the prize is living, proving all the little details suddenly feels less important. I've always loved being outside in nature ever since I was a little kid growing up in Kansas. When I was young, I spent a lot of time exploring the fields, woods, and hills around where I lived. As I got older, I found out I was pretty good at painting pictures of landscapes and outdoor scenes. For the past 15 years, I've traveled around Kansas and other nearby states, looking for nice natural areas to paint. I like doing my painting outdoors while looking right at the scenery, because I think it helps me capture it better in my artwork. Most people might not think Kansas is very exciting, but I've always thought the wide open spaces, big skies, and prairie landscapes were really beautiful in their own way. At least that's what I thought, until I went painting out in the Flint Hills one day and encountered something out there that scared me pretty bad. One warm afternoon in early May, I packed up my easel, canvases, and painting supplies into my old pickup truck and headed west from my home in Topeka. After about a two hour drive, I reached the Flint Hills and found a quiet dirt road to take me deeper into the prairie. I followed it for several miles until I came across a picturesque valley ringed by grassy slopes. It looked like the perfect spot to set up and paint for a few hours before sunset. I pulled off the dirt road and got my supplies ready on a little rise overlooking the valley. The only sounds were the whispers of the warm breeze through the tall grass and the buzzing of insects. I started blocking in the shapes of the hills and the pockets of trees and shrubs, dotting the landscape. As I worked, I kept glancing up to reference the scenery in front of me. That's when I noticed something odd further down in the valley. At first, I thought it was a couple of deer moving through the grass. But as I looked closer, I realized it was far too large to be any deer I'd ever seen. Something was definitely ambling through that valley, kicking up the grass and wildflowers as it moved. I stopped painting and just watched, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. The shape seemed vaguely animal-like as it lumbered along, but it was massive. It honestly looked like it was the size of an elephant from the distance I was at. I could make out a thick, fur-covered body and an arched line that looked like it could be a ridge spine or hump running along its back. At one point, the creature turned slightly in my direction, and I got a better look at its head and upper body. That's when I felt a chill of fear. Whatever this thing was, it definitely wasn't any known animal. It had a squash, thick snout, and two tusks protruding from the sides of its mouth. Its eyes were small and seemed to gaze outwards vacantly as it continued shambling through the valley. 
I watched in horrified fascination as this unidentified beast plodded along for several more minutes before disappearing behind a rise at the far end of the valley. My mind was racing. What in the world could this creature have been? It looked like some prehistoric mammal had come back to life, an escaped elephant-like animal from a private zoo or facility. I had no idea. Once it was out of sight, I realized how tightly I had been gripping my palate and brushes. My hands were shaking from the adrenaline in my body. I looked around quickly to make sure I was still alone on that little rise. With shaky motions, I packed up my supplies, loaded them back into my truck as quickly as I could, and got the hell out of there. I'm not ashamed to admit that I told everyone how absolutely terrified I was. I've recounted this experience to a few close friends and family members. I feel that they are the only ones who know me well enough to know I'm telling the truth. In my heart, though, I know exactly what I saw that day out in the Flint Hills. And it haunts me not knowing what kind of beast was lumbering through that isolated Kansas Valley. All I can say is that if you value your sanity, avoid going out to paint or hike alone in those endless prairies. Because you just never know what untold mysteries still lurk out there, hidden away from the modern world. I don't know if I've heard of somebody hating a dog as much as Jack hates this one. That's if it's even a dog, I guess. That's kind of the crux of his story. If you believe it's a dog, well, it's probably the most persistent dog that ever lived. And if it isn't a dog, if you believe it's something else like Jack believes, then we've all got a lot more to worry about. Jack owns a farm in the Southwest, Arizona to be exact, dry climate, more mountains on the horizon than neighbors, it's beautiful, it's peaceful, it's isolated. And because of all that, it's a little dangerous too. Because of all that, when you get a story like Jack's, you realize just how strange and dangerous parts of the United States can be. Jack set out on the back of a four-wheeler one day. He knew he was looking at maybe a 30-minute drive across uncooperative terrain, but he was going to make the trip regardless. In the distance, earlier that morning, he had spotted vultures enough of the giant birds to blot out part of the sky, like swirling splotches of paint spilled in the sky. They were circling something, he knew that much, but what could have attracted so many of them? Whatever it was, it was on Jack's property. His mind was made up. He had to get to the bottom of it. He thought maybe they'd fly away. He thought as he got closer that the birds would scatter and that the rumble of the engine and the size of the four-wheeler would be enough to spook the birds. Then he could investigate in peace, he thought. Except as Jack got closer, the group of vultures didn't fly away at all. By the way, did you know that a group of vultures is called a kettle? I mention that because in this case, that name is even more appropriate than usual. You see, as Jack got closer, he realized that not every bird was in the sky. He passed one, hunchbacked and narrow-eyed, squatting on the top of a cactus. He passed two more, standing motionless on the ground. The closer Jack got to the spiral of birds overhead, the more he was mixed into the current of that kettle, and he got all stirred up with them, out there in the sun and the heat. But the birds weren't enough to make him turn back. Instead, the first time he considered it was when the stench hit his nose. Death, acidic, and almost medicinal. It burned his nose and nostrils like someone had poured bleach into his lungs. It made his eyes water and his mouth salivate, like he'd just taken one too many sips from his whiskey. It made him nauseous, disoriented old Jack, and the smell was getting stronger all too quickly. He'd come too far, though. He stopped the four-wheeler and continued on foot, thinking that if he moved just a little slower, that it would be easier for him to adapt and breathe. He crested over a particular rock, finally looking out to the stretch of land where the vultures had gathered. He expected to see a carcass, maybe even a few. He thought maybe a herd of loose cattle had gotten lost, sick and perished. But Jack saw a dog instead. He thought it was a dog anyway, stout and muscular like a pit bull, hairless, more scabs on its skin than fur. It had to be sick. That was the only way to explain the smell. Jack squinted in the sunlight, shielded his face with his hand, and tried to make out more details. The animal was still alive, he knew that much. 
It was chewing on something caught in its paw, a trivial little thorn or piece of bramble. Its eyes bulged from its skin. Spines or quills of some kind formed a line down its back like a mohawk. Jack didn't know of any dogs with quills in their skin. He'd never even seen a porcupine up close and couldn't imagine that their spines would be so long. No, whatever it was, was definitely growing from the dog itself. Had the vultures gathered just to watch this thing? Jack wondered if he'd stumbled upon something else entirely. One of nature's great rituals. Something man wasn't supposed to see. He was certainly an intruder. When the wind changed direction, the dog agreed. Its nose snapped up to sniff the air. A long, tube-like tongue flopped from its mouth. Was it searching for him? Jack started to back away. He felt his skin crawl as the creature's tongue curled into its mouth like the proboscis of a butterfly. The rock shifted and rolled down the hill. The dog's eyes jumped to Jack's location, and he felt the creature's gaze setting fire to his position. It was marking him, he knew. Marking him as prey. The vultures yapped and hissed and finally scattered as the beast sprinted for Jack's position. Jack yelled and ran, wishing he'd brought some sort of weapon out with him. He half fell down the ridge, back to his four-wheeler, stealing glances over his shoulder all the while. The sweat on his brow went cold when he saw that the dog was still coming, still chasing him. He started the engine and turned the four-wheeler around. It was right behind him now. Jack accelerated, tried to tear his way back home. The vehicle lurched and sputtered when the beast sunk its teeth into one of the rear tires. The remaining three peeled out, trying to find purchase on the loose dirt and stone. It smelled like death and fire as the stress of the engine mixed with the creature's sickly aroma. How could it be so strong? Why was it so determined to keep him there, to stop him? Suddenly, the four-wheeler yanked free. The dog yelped and recoiled, turning its head from side to side as if surprised by the pain. Teeth had been ripped from its mouth. It wasn't a smooth ride home, but at least Jack no longer felt hunted. He watched the creature disappear in the distance, shrinking gradually until it was nothing but one of the melded colors on the rocky horizon. He sighed, locked himself inside his home, and decided right then and there to never again interrupt a kettle of vultures. I'll be honest with you, I don't believe in ghosts. That's kind of silly, right? Wind and old houses and electrical mishaps, I believe in those things. But real bona fide ghosts? I don't think so. I don't believe in them. Sarah did, though. She believed with her whole heart. And maybe that's because of where Sarah grew up. Smack dab in the Midwest, where there's nothing but soy factories and cornfields to keep you company. She talked about her home with a type of endearment. She described the fields like oceans. She was fond of the factories, where so many of her loved ones had made their livings. She was bored, though. I knew she was. Who could blame her? And bored people tell stories. They come up with things to keep themselves occupied. They let a tall tale or a superstitious friend influence the way that they see the world. They spread rumors and gossip until those rumors feel true. Folklore gets born somewhere in there fables, myths, none of it's true, any way you shake it. That doesn't mean all of Sarah's stories were bad, though. I'll tell you the good one. I'll tell you the one that, well, it made me uneasy. It didn't make me scared, just a little unsure. Sarah's aunt had passed away, and Sarah was charged with going through her old belongings, packing her aunt's life into little boxes and distributing them amongst the family. Pictures, clothes, odds and ends. It's the painful and arduous part of passing that people don't often talk about. Somebody has to deal with the stuff. Sarah was the lucky winner, so to speak. She described her aunt as something of a recluse. The house was from the 1800s, originally built for a family that had gotten rich off of the railroad, and it swallowed up Sarah's aunt like the woman was a drop of water on a hot summer day. She disappeared into that home, never came out, not for anyone wouldn't let people come over either. Each box that Sarah sealed felt like the next nail in her aunt's coffin. All these parts of her that had been hidden away were now being tucked into closets and garages, where they get kissed by dust 
and buried underneath towels or tools. Sarah slowed down when she made that conclusion. Even though sifting through every item hurt, it felt right. It felt like the respectful thing to do, acknowledging that her aunt had actually lived. When Sarah found the doll, she made an exception. It was an unremarkable child's toy, something from the 40s or 50s, a doll in a long skirt with a bonnet hanging from her head. Both eyes were missing, popped back into the toy skull. They rattled around like marbles whenever the doll was tipped or shaken. It made her uncomfortable. That little eyeless thing. She packed it away immediately, taped it inside a box all to itself. That night, Sarah had a nightmare. She dreamt of being shut in a coffin. When she woke up, the doll was back. Not in anywhere special. Not in any place that Sarah could notice it right away. But eventually, she was backing up, balancing a stack of books in her hands. And sure enough, that doll was beneath her feet. She tripped and nearly fell, dropped all those books and screamed when she saw the toy. Back in a box it went, taped doubly this time. Then the knocking started, something on the walls, against the baseboards in the hallway. Every time Sarah's eyes started to flutter shut, the knocking came back, and every time she searched for it, it went silent again. She never saw the doll rapping against the wood with its little bald fist. She never saw it move at all, not really but she knew it was responsible. She was so sure of it that the next day, she added the box with the doll inside to the pile of trash by the curb. It was picked up in the afternoon. Destroyed, Sarah figured. She hurried to finish up with her aunt's belongings. By the evening, she was confident that she'd be done. She'd be out of there the next day. All that remained was the furniture, too big to pack into her tiny car. So for one last time, Sarah tried to sleep. She woke to the sound of dragging, something loud and heavy, scraping across the floor. Her eyes jumped open. She could feel her heart beating out of her chest. She was gazing up at the ceiling, at the same ceiling that had always been above her aunt's bed. But it was different. She couldn't place it. She wondered briefly if she was dreaming. Then the bed jerked to the side, dragged, scraped. The wooden legs carved a shallow groove into the floor beneath her. Sarah rocked atop the mattress and wailed. She clutched the blankets to her chest and sat upright. The bed had been pulled away from the wall. It was nearly in the center of the room now. Closer to the door, she realized. She ran out barefoot and half-dressed, got into her car, drove halfway down the block and stopped. She threw out every box from the back seat and every box from the trunk. She tossed her aunt's belongings onto the side of the road, and when she was satisfied, she started driving again. Drove all the way home and never had a problem again. Eventually, one of her aunt's photo albums made its way back into her possession, and, you guessed it, in one of those pictures, Sarah saw the doll. Showed it to me, too. Just to put some emphasis at the end of her story. I couldn't believe it. I don't believe in ghosts, you see. Silly stuff. But that doesn't mean I didn't wake up the first night I heard it, thinking something was knocking on my walls. Better that than finding a doll, I guess.